So in Ezra chapter 6, of course, kind of bringing up the speed, uh, they're attempting to rebuild the house of God here, and I don't want to go on and on and, and belabor the point, but if you're familiar with the story, uh, some of God's enemies have brought the work of the house of God to a standstill, and they say, you know, the Jews reply and say, well, you know what, you need to go back and go through your records back there and, and see what Cyrus had to say. See what Cyrus decreed, the king that uh, in, in originally initiated the restoration of God's house, the originally initiated the, the, settlement, the resettlement of God's people after they came out of Babylon. And that's where we find ourselves in the story. And I want to preach to you this morning about the wisdom of Cyrus, the wisdom of Cyrus. We see several of Cyrus's words there in the beginning. And I think there's some things that we could learn from, from Cyrus and apply to this church and apply to ourselves as individuals. Of course, we're in our second year now, and I think there's some good things that we could read, learn from Cyrus. The things that he made a priority, we need to make a priority. The things that he said to do, we should do. We should apply to our own lives and to this church. Now, if you look there in verse 3, it says, In the first year of Cyrus the king, he, that he made a decree concerning the house of God. So what we see, first of all, is that it's important for us to put God's business first. People need to learn to put God's business first. That's what Cyrus did. It was the very first year of his reign. The first year of, of Cyrus, the king, uh, the king, the same Cyrus, the king, made a decree. So the first thing he does when he gets into office, first time, thing he does when he takes the throne, and says, we're going to let the house be builded. And this was concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. And I think this is something that we could learn from Cyrus. This is some wisdom that we could apply to our own lives. That we need to make church a priority in our life. And, you know, this isn't something new. And you know, be perfectly honest, a lot of what I'm going to say this morning is not new. In fact, it's quite basic. It's pretty fundamental. But often it's those basic things, it's the fundamental things that people choke on in the Christian life. It's these simple things that they don't nail down that cause them to never grow as a Christian, to have problems, to never get things resolved, to never move on and do something for God. Is that they don't put the simple things, the most basic things, first. But that's what we see Cyrus do. And, you know, that's a wise thing. I think Cyrus had some wisdom here when he said, hey, I'm in, I'm in charge now. I'm going to make some, some laws. I'm going to rule. And the first thing I want to do is to, and of course we understand God was moving and working and put it in his heart to do these things, but he didn't resist that. You know, he went with it. And I would probably say that right now there's probably some people that just hearing me say, you know, you need to be in church. You need to make it a priority. God might be moving in your heart. You know, you need to be like Cyrus and not resist that. We need, to, we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The Bible says there's some people, that's their manner. They get into a habit of forsaking the assembly. You know, and it's been two years now, and you know, when those, how many people, just out of curiosity, were here from the very first service? Just, a, just two people, okay? Now, were there only two people in the very surf, first service here? Was that it, just two people? Or were there more people? There were more people. Well, where are they? You know, where did they go? You know, and, and the two years we've been here, we've seen people come, stick around, and go. And look, I'm not saying you have to be in this church to be right with God. But you need to be in a church. You need to be in a King James, independent, fundamental Baptist church. Whether it's this church, or another church in town, or another state, wherever it is. But the point is, you need to be like Cyrus and make God's house a priority in your life. Amen. And you know, there's, in two years, you know, we haven't been running two for two years. There's been a lot of people coming and going. You know, and, and, I, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but, you know, some people it's best that they moved on, but there's some people that have moved on, and, and I look around and I say, well, where are they now? What are they doing? Why aren't they here? And I already know why they're not here, because they, haven't, they don't have the wisdom that Cyrus has to say, to put first things first, to make God's business a priority in their life. We need to make church a priority, not an option. I mean, this is like, this is the most fundamental, just basic thing in the Christian life. And yet people struggle with this. And if we would just, you know, I remember early on in my Christian life, I just made a decision. I'm going to be in church. I'm going to be in church. Unless I'm sick or there's some, you know, outstanding circumstance or something out of the ordinary, I'm going to be in church. If I go travel to another state, if I'm on vacation, I'm going to make a point to get my family, to get myself in church. I made it a priority in my life. It's not even a question. I mean, do you think when we woke up this morning in our hotel across the street and said, do you think I should go preach tonight, honey? Should I go over there and, and run services? You know, and, and you know, you say, well, you're the deacon, it's your job. And, and I understand that. But you know what? Leading up to that, you know, in the 17 plus years that I've been in church, I've only been a deacon for two of them. You know, the other 15 years or so or whatever, 
No one was paying me to come to church. Right. No one was twisting my arm. No one was, you know, you know, no one was going to be, you know, coming to knocking on my door and say, hey, where were you? They didn't need to do that. You know why? Because I made it a priority in my life to be in church. It, was, it wasn't even a question. It, and it, it's not a question. And some people just need to get to the point in their life where they're not, not going to wake up every Sunday morning and go, am I going to be in church today? It's, it's a, it should be a silly question. It shouldn't even enter your mind. You need to make church a priority and not an option. Because so many people, they, just, they think church is option, optional. You know, the church for which Christ died, that shed his blood, that he purchased with his own blood, that's optional. It wasn't optional for him. It cost him his life. You know, he died for the church. I think it's pretty important. And again, whether it's this church or another church, we need to make church a priority in our life. If you would, go over to keep something in, 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 uh, in Ezra there, or yeah, go over to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> I mean, think about all the other things we make a priority in our life. I guarantee you, tomorrow, Monday morning, several you know, men in this church are going to get up and go to work without even thinking about it. Some of them, you know, they're going to get up, they're going to get dressed, they're going to brush their teeth, I hope. They're going to drink some coffee, they're going to, you know, eat some breakfast. They're going to kiss the wife and kids goodbye, and they're going to go out the door, and they're, never, they're not going to wake up and think, should I go to church today, or should I go to work today? You know, there's some moms in this room, they're going to wake up tomorrow, and they're not even going to think about it. They're just going to get up, they're going to start taking care of the kids, they're going to see their husband off, they're going to homeschool, they're going to clean, they're going to do all the duties that a mother has, that a wife has to do, and they're not going to question whether or not they should do any of them. It's just instinct. They're just going to do it because they made it a priority in their life. We go to work. We teach our kids. We raise our families. You know, and, and, not, and you know what? And quite honest, and honestly, you know, it's not optional, but I mean, the world would tell you it's optional today. You don't need to go to work. You could just collect a check. You know, go on employment, collect welfare. You don't need to teach your kids. You could send them off somewhere else to have them taught. They don't make it a priority. They say it's not an optional. But you know what? There's still people that have the character to get up and do that. Think of all the things that we do in life that we just do because we've made them a priority in our life. You know, those are things that, you know, responsible adults do that we're supposed to do. But think about all the things that, that really aren't that important that we make a priority. There's some things in life that just, they, they, they don't benefit, benefit us at all. I'm not saying they're sinful, but I'm just saying they're just frivolous. They're a waste of time. They're really not benefiting us, but we make them a priority. You know, we're not going to miss this certain show. We're not going to miss this game. We're not going to miss this activity. It's a priority. So I'm going to be at the bowling league every Friday because I got a team and we got, you know, a silly shirt and, you know, and, and whatever. And I, I bought shoes and a ball and everything else, right? And I'm not against anybody that goes to a bowling league. That's your thing, you know, have fun. But I'm just, what I'm trying to make the point is there's things that we make a priority in life that aren't even, don't even benefit us at all. That might even cost us something. You know, hobbies or activities that we do. We just do it because we like it. <laughs> Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 9. He said, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one unto another uh, with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. You know, you need to make business a priority. And, you know, church is business. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. You know, I, you know we, we get involved in a lot of other business in life. Some of it's important, some of it not so much. But, you know, there is some spiritual business that we all need to attend to. And, you know, and there's, there's a business meeting every Sunday right here. There's also a midweek, you know. I don't know if you know that either. <laughs> you know, and I'm not going to say, you know, three to thrive. I believe that. I live that. I have lived that. I preach that. I practice that. And I'm not, I'm not down on people that can't make it to every single service. You know, I understand but, I mean, out of the three services that we have here a week, we should, we should have enough spiritual character to say, I'm going to make it to at least one. Amen. I'm going to go to God's business meeting, and I'm going to hear what the CEO in heaven has to say. What are, what are, the, what are the plans this week? <clears throat> we need to make it our, our business. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Boy, we get fervent about so many other things, don't we? We, go, we get fervent in spirit, and we serve so many other things. But I want to ask us this morning, have we decided to make church a priority? I mean, that's what Cyrus did. He said, look, we're going to build the house of God. This is important. We're going to, it's the first thing he took care of when he got in office. So that's the, you know, that's the first point from the wisdom of Cyrus. We need to get busy serving the Lord. 
You say, well, I come to church. Well, great. I'm glad. You know, you're faithful to church. You're coming. But now it's time to serve God. Because, you know, just showing up and sitting and, and, and staring at me and try to keep your eyelids open and, you know, and, 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 and nod when you're supposed to nod, you know, that's not really that hard. I've done it for, I did it for a while. You know, it's not the most difficult thing. I'm the one working up here this morning, okay? But it says there that you need to be serving the Lord. You know, and I, under, I, I definitely believe that coming to church, that's part of that. But, you know, there's more to the Christian life than just coming to church. You know, there's the soul winning that needs to take place. There's the Bible reading that needs to be done. There's all these other things that we need to do to serve the Lord. We need to get fervent about it. But we're never going to do any of those things if we don't make them a priority. If we don't have the wisdom that Cyrus had to put God's business first. So you say, well, we're doing that. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm kind of preaching the choir this morning. You're all here. You know, hopefully that continues. But look, go back to Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. He said in the, verse 3, In the first year of Cyrus, king of uh, the, the king, the same, the same Cyrus the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded and the palace uh, wherewith they offered, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. He said there, let the house be builded. Let the house be builded. You know, and I want to kind of just make this point here. This, one. this is kind of be, I might be a little bit, you know, just kind of making application as we go. But I think these are all things that are important for us to remember, especially on our second anniversary as we're moving forward as a church. We're thinking about the future and, and what we've accomplished already. But, you know, we need to let the house be built. I think sometimes in church we get so worried about the results. We get so worried about, you know, numbers. We say, boy, you've been here two years and this is all the bigger you've gotten. You know, this year on our average attendance actually went down a little bit be perfectly honest say does that get you down nope Amen. it doesn't it doesn't bother me at all because you know I'm, and again i'm getting ahead of myself again because it's about it's about quality not quantity Amen. i mean yeah we could we could drop the standards around here and bring in a crowd and, and knock down some walls move to a bigger facility get some purple lights you know we could be just like that church up the road that you know has thousand people show up or whatever and we could get a rock band and i could just you know put on a graphic t-shirt and some some jeans with some holes in it, and I could just get up and rap with you guys and jive. I could just share with you, and I could, lo I could soften my voice. And I could, I, see, I have the ability. <laughs> I, I can get breathy, and, and I could talk like this. And some of you guys wouldn't. You know, I'd probably lose some of you, right? <laughs> Any man with hair on his legs would be like, I'm out of here, right? I'm not going to listen to that guy talking like that. I can't stand it. I don't know how they've listened to some of these guys. They sound so effeminate. But that's what's popular today. And if we wanted to go that route as a church, oh, we could do it. I mean, obviously, we're under Pastor Anderson's authority. We actually couldn't do that on our own. <laughs> you know, not that they're wait, we're waiting in the wings to do that either, but I'm just saying, you know, using it as an example, is that, that churches do that all the time. Baptist churches. I mean, I remember I was watching an independent fundamental Baptist church service. I mean, an independent fundamental Baptist church. And there, I watched their song service, and it was just like that. It, I was like, are you sure this is a Baptist church? It sounded, it sound, because I've been in some of these contemporary churches where it's just, as the deer panteth for the water. Just this breathy, soft, you know, emotional singing. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, where's the, where the march? Where's the faith is the victory? You know, stand up, stand up. That's the songs I like. The, the strong, bold, march-type songs that encourage us to, to live for the Lord, not just have this emotional experience. But we need to, you know, so we need to understand something here at Faithful Word Tucson. You know, we're going we're gonna to preach out of a King James Bible. We're going to preach all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. And if people don't like it, you know, there's other churches in town. This isn't going to be the most popular place. We're not trying to be. But you know what? God will build His church. He said that. That's what he told Peter. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Because it's quality that matters most, not quantity. You know, and if, if people come in and it turns out they turn out to be bozos or bad or just no good or whatever, they're just here to, you know, cause disunity, I want them to leave. And I don't care if that brings the attendance down. I don't care if the offering drops. It doesn't bother me because it's about quality, not quantity. <clears throat> you know, people will come and they'll, and, and here's the other thing, you know, we want, we want quality people, but they don't have to walk in quality. They don't have to walk in, have it all put together, 
saying all the right things, doing all the right things. All I want is people that have a tender heart and are willing to hear the word of God and get themselves pointed in the right direction and start making steps in that direction. That's all I care about. Because I've seen, you know, I've seen it time and time again, people that come in, boy, you, they got it all together. They're serving God. They say the part, everything they're supposed to say. They look the part. But you know what? A year or two later, where are they? They're gone. But then you have somebody else, maybe they don't have it all together, but they want to learn. They want to grow. They want to, they want to stick around. They want to be faithful. You know, they don't have to be quality when they get here, but if they're pointing the right, right direction and they have a tender heart, give it time and they will be quality. By the grace of God, God's power will work. <clears throat> if you would, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. So what I'm saying is this. Let the house be builded. Don't get so caught up on numbers. Don't get so worried about whether we're growing or whether we're shrinking. Don't worry about that. Just serve God. And here's the thing, it's, it's just, a, it's amazing, I've been thinking about this. People come to churches and they look out, they say, well, this church is small, and they, they stick around, and it gets smaller, and they say, well, they get discouraged, and then they leave. Well, if you're worried about the church getting bigger, why are you leaving? It's kind of ironic. <clears throat> but look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, and you want to talk about somebody who didn't start out that great, this is the Apostle Paul. And he said in verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did an ignorant unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You know, we're not trying to, we're not trying to build churches with perfect people in it. We're not trying to go out and have the perfect church. It doesn't exist. We're not going out in the community and knocking doors and inviting people to church and, and saving souls to try to find people that have it all put together. That's not what Jesus said. He came to the world to save sinners. That's everybody. And he says there, he, this is the faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause, he said, this is the reason that he obtained mercy. For this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life, ever asking, life everlasting. He's saying, look, God chose me for this purpose. He showed this mercy. Why? To use me as an example, as a pattern to people that would live uh, after me, to, to the generations to come. That look, it doesn't matter how, how out of sorts with God with somebody is, if they're willing to you know, admit that they're wrong and get right with God and start living for him, God will use them. Yep. And I don't care where they're at in life. I don't care how bad their situation is. If a person will just get right with God and start living for him and being faithful and put first things first and make God a priority, God will use that person. Yep. More than the guy that's got it all put together. And look what the, look at the result is. You know, when somebody like Paul who was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, when God showed him grace and mercy and he took that and he started to live for God, you know who get, ends up getting glorified? Not Paul. Paul's not the one that gets glorified. It's the Lord. Look at verse 17. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, he's the one that gets the glory. When somebody else, when somebody comes in, a Paul, you know, it comes in and gets right with God. <clears throat> That's what I'm, what I'm trying to say is this. Let the house be builded and let God add to the church who he's going to add to the church. Now, I understand that we, we definitely do, we have our part to play. You know, we got to go out and knock the doors, invite people out, do follow up where it's appropriate, you know, and try to bring people, invite them out, let them know that we're here, you know, and not get cultish about it, you know. <laughs> but we want people to come out and, and join us, of course. You know, but the first part of that equation is to go, you know, to go knock the door and invite them out. <coughs> and let God build the church. And you know who's going to be glorified? And not, if we don't get so caught up and like, well, I, you know, I, I really like so-and-so. I, I, I want them to be part of the church, but I really don't like this person. I wish they weren't part of the church. It's not up to you. I guarantee you there are some apostles who are like, Saul? Really? That's who you're picked, Lord? He's going to be the light to the Gentiles now? He's going to carry your message? That guy who is consenting to Stephen's death? 
That guy, they probably, I, I guarantee you, there's probably some apostles, some early believers who are like, I don't, I don't know about Paul. I really don't think he fits in here. I don't think he's our stripe. It's not up to you. It's up to God. And when God adds somebody to the church, you know what? He's the one that's glorified because he's the one that's doing the work. So let the house be builded, you know, and, and don't get so hung up on the numbers, but do your part to help to grow the church. You know, people, they want, the, they want the church to grow. And I'm saying God will build the church, but that's not, to, you know, I don't want to get this attitude either. Where we just sit back and just don't do anything. Well, God will add them. We're not Calvinists. We're not just, you know, I, I believe God will put it in people's hearts to be here. And if they want to, you know, uh, obey the, the, the moving of the spirit and come and join us, great. But we still have a part to, to do. You know, and that starts with us being here, as I kind of talked about a minute ago. The irony of people are like, well, I really want the church to grow. And since it's not, I'm going to quit going. You know, do your part by just being here, just by showing up, okay? But how about going out and doing a soul winning, handing out the invite, preaching the gospel, inviting them out, you know, encouraging new converts to get baptized. You know, and this is something that we'll, you know, we'll talk more about in, in coming months, you know, something to think about how we can, you know, uh, do more follow-up and things like that. Do the invites, do the follow-up. You know, and, and just since we're kind of talking about the church on our second anniversary and kind of what's laying ahead, you know, I don't, I don't think it's wrong for me to just kind of let folks know that, you know, my plan for that right now, you know, Lord willing, is for me to move down here in February, you know, and live here, hopefully right around the corner. You know, I've got a couple neighborhoods, you know, within walking distance, and I'd, I'd say that's, that would work for me, Lord, you know. <clears throat> and once that happens, you know, well, we can, you know, it's because here's the thing. It's kind of hard for me to go, you guys need to do more follow-up, you know, when I'm an hour and a half away and I'm not doing any, you know. It's, and I'm not saying that don't let that stop you. Don't let me be your excuse, but it's kind of hard for me to get up and, and bring the hammer down on that or, you know, try to and teach that and, 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 and lead by example when I, you know, I'm not really able to do that as well as I could if I lived here. So all I'm saying is this, you want to help the church grow, you want the church to grow, well, do your part. You know, and I'm excited about what lies ahead of us at the, at the beginning of the year. When, you know, once I am down here, Lord willing, and you know, we, can, we can get together, we can talk about that, we can develop you know, some ideas about how to bring people in. You know. But do your part to help the church grow. That was the wisdom that Cyrus he had. He said, let the house be builded. The place where they did what? Where they offered sacrifices. You see, the house of God is a place where you offer sacrifices. Now, here's the thing. Church, church is a give and take relationship. You know, and, and here's, you know, it's, it's fine if we're, in that, if we're in that needy type of place in life where we, that we need the church to do more for us than we can do for it. That's fine. You know, we all probably start out there. You know, we need the preaching the word of God. We need... Uh, the fellowship, we always need that. But we should grow to a place where it's, you know, we're also giving back too. You know, through our service, through being here, through participating in the program. You know, we, it's a place to offer sacrifices. You know, sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your abilities. Sacrifice, you know, offer something to God in the house of the Lord. Because <clears throat> here's the thing, a lot of people today, they, they want a Christian life that's not going to cost them anything. But, you know, I would submit that that's not really a Christian life at all then. That that's not the calling of the Christian life. He, he, Paul said, Yea, all that and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, if you're really going to live the Christian life, if you're going to take a biblical stand, you are going to suffer persecution. You know, with, be it from family or co-workers or the world in general, whatever. But I'm trying to make this point is this, is that, you know, be prepared to sacrifice in the Christian life. Let, understand that the Christian life, the house of God, is a place of sacrifice. It's not all just take, 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 what's in it for me. I understand there's things that we need to get from the house of God, from, the, 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 from, from fellowshipping together and the preaching and things like that. But we also got to get to a place where we're giving back, where we're sacrificing of our time, our energy, our abilities to go out and, and, and to live the Christian life. Go over to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. The Bible says in Luke chapter 9, it says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me to go and bury my father. 
And Jesus, Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And also another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let, him for, but let me first go bid for them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I think one of the things that, that people don't want to give up is it's sometimes it's, it's something from their past, you know, good or bad. Sometimes people get involved in the Christian life and then they let these external things, you know, family, whatever, kind of keep, the, keep them from keeping their eyes forward where they belong. You know, and this is, every time I read this, I always think about this analogy and I probably preached it more than once too. But if you ever, you know, it, it, there's this thing in Michigan called grass, okay? And we have these things called yards, right? <laughs> which are bigger than, you know, not, you know, the house is down here. It's like, it's like a litter box in the back. Like, I, I'm like, it's like, that, is that for the cat? You know, I have children, you know. Anyway, I'm just picking on, 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 on the Southwest a little bit. But we had the big yard, you know, where the house we left in Michigan, we had a big front yard. I mean, it wasn't massive. It wasn't like in a state or anything. But you had to get the lawnmower out and mow that thing, you know, every so often. And it was, you know, half hour, 45, maybe an hour. But I remember, you know, it was a long yard, so, you know, you had to make sure that you mowed it with straight lines. You didn't want to be that guy that when everyone drove by could see the, you know, the wavy lines. Or you'd get real fancy, you'd do the, start doing the cross cut so you'd have the, the patterns and stuff like that. But the point I'm trying to make is this, is that if you wanted to cut a straight line, you had to look way down at the end. They say, they teach you that in driving, uh, and when, I, when I, I drove for a company, they said you should look 8 to 12 seconds down the road and learn to keep your eyes there, and that will actually center you in the lane. Not to just look right in front, but you need to look ahead. And that's kind of what the Christian life is like. You know, if you want to have nice straight lines, if you don't want to get caught up by some obstacle, you can't, you know, we don't drive a car by looking in the rearview mirror. Say, oh, what did I not hit? You know? <laughs> oh, oh, I missed that too. Great. You know, well, we look ahead. And the Christian life is like that. You need to not look behind. You need to put your hand to the plow, and you need to look forward. You need to look ahead what's ahead of you. <clears throat> and so many people, they end up kind of looking back, you know, and they get these, uh, they, they get messed up. <clears throat> they get concerned about all these other things. Now, of course, in Luke chapter 9, it's a very unique circumstance. You know, Jesus Christ is here on the earth. That's the time to kind of, you know, everything else kind of takes a back seat. But look there in Philippians chapter 3, where you are. It says in verse 7, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. You know, I, I love Paul's attitude here. He said, I suffered them loss, but then he said, and, and he said, and I thought about them every day, and I thought about everything I gave up for the Lord, and I thought about how much the Christian life has cost me. He said, you know what? I, gave, I counted them with loss, and then I counted them as dumb. Yeah. He said, I didn't look back on all that stuff I gave up and go, sure do miss that. He went, man, I'm glad that's over. That stinks, that past, all those things I gave up. You know, I've, met, I've met more than one Christian who they just, they lament everything they left behind. You know, some lifestyle, some place they lived, Whatever. Say, so, oh, it was just so much better here. It was so much better when I could do this or when I was involved in that. You know, you might have, you might have counted those things lost, but, you know, you need to count them as dung, too. You need, I mean, that's what he calls it there. I do count them, but dung, that I may win Christ. You know, the Christian life is going to cost you. It's going to cost some things. But, you know, those things that it costs us, we should also be able to look at those things and say, you know what, they're not, they don't even compare to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. If me having to give up these things or forsake this or forsake that or whatever or be uncomfortable means I get to have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, I'll take it. And everything else is done. You see, the house of God, you know, we need to make it a priority and understand something, that it's a place of sacrifice. But don't come in with the attitude of like, I'm giving up so much, I've sacrificed so much. You should say, I've given, we should say, I've given all those things up and they're just, they're dung. They don't even matter to me. Cyrus, he goes on, if you want to go back to uh, Ezra chapter 6. He said that, uh, Let the house be built in the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. Let the foundations be strongly laid. He said, look, when you're building something, when you're starting out, you want to make sure you have a strong foundation. 
Because without a strong foundation, it doesn't matter how nice you make it look, eventually it's going to start to droop, it's going to start to fall, you're going to start to get cracks in the walls. You ever, you know, you'll see that in houses sometimes. You'll see these in really nice houses. You'll be in a house and you'll have this giant crack running up a wall. So what happened there? Well, the foundation settled, it moved, it shifted. So how do we apply that to the church? Well, I think the foundation, of course, that it's talking about is the Bible. It's God's Word. We need to have a foundation that's laid upon God's word. We need to preach and implement biblical preaching in our lives. You know, not just to be hearers of the words, but, but doers also. It's not enough just to hear the biblical preaching. It's enough, it, you must put it into practice. It's not just enough to show up and say, yeah, I agree with that. You need to walk out the door and do something with it. Apply it to your life. Lay the foundation. I should have had you go to Matthew 7, but if you want, go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We all know Matthew 7. Jesus said, Therefore, so, therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. But notice he said it's two things there. It's the guy not only that hears the sayings, but also does them. You know, it's, you know, the contractor doesn't go to the house to build a house and say, well, that's where the foundation go. The blueprint says it right there. And then doesn't lay it. And say, well, so let's get the sticks up and put a roof on. Would you do, would you, well, did you lay the foundation? No, but I looked at it in the blueprint. I know exactly how wide it's supposed to be and how tall, where it's supposed to go. I know how much rebar is supposed to go in every so many feet. I know how dense the concrete's supposed to be, what kind of mix it's supposed to be. I know all about the foundation. I've got it all figured out. Well, did you pour it? No. Oh, okay, well, the, yeah, proceed. That house is going to crumble and fall quickly because it has no foundation. You need to let the foundation be strongly laid in your life. I mean, you need to, you need to just, you know, hear the biblical preaching and then start putting it into practice and make it a habit. And make it such a habit in your life that it becomes second nature. It's just who you are. It's, it's woven into the fabric of your being. Like church attendance, Bible reading. You know, the basics, like I said at the very beginning of the sermon, the simple things that everybody just chokes on and trips on in the Christian life. The things that cause their, their spiritual house to begin to crumble. They start to get cracks in the wall. The doorway starts to do this. The door doesn't close the same anymore. You know, just little things. Look, if you paid a, like, a bunch of money for a nice house like that and that started to happen, that would drive you nuts. You'd be calling the contractor. You'd be, you know, you'd be trying to work something out here. But are we, do we have that attitude in our spiritual life? Some people, I think, I don't think they do. I think they, they're perfectly fine with a big crack in their wall in the spiritual life. Like, yeah, that's where the crack goes. It's, no, it's, no, I planned that. Right, this, is, this is on purpose. You know, so I, I could put a nail in it without having to pound it and then hang a picture. <laughs> and the picture gets crooked. No, I, I meant to hang the picture that way. It's abstract. It's modern. You, know? <laughs> you wouldn't understand it. You know? <laughs> It's all up to interpretation, you know. But that's how some people's spiritual life is. They've never taken the time to lay a spiritual foundation. They want, they want to get so, they're so worried about, you know, where the, where the plants are going to go or what kind of furniture, what color the wall is going to be. It's like, well, why don't you start with the basics? Why don't you just start with laying a strong foundation in God's word? Because that's what's, that's what's going to help you. That's what's going to cause you to make it in the Christian life. You know, because here, here's the thing. We're coming into two years of this church and two years, is that's when the honeymoon ends for people, okay? Now, some people, you know, they haven't been here. They're, maybe you're only a year in. Maybe you're only a year and a half in, whatever. Maybe even less. You know, when you get to the, about that two-year mark, that's when you start to see where, where, where the excitement wears off, like in marriage. You know, we're just being honest. Anyone who's married knows this is true. You know, I'm not saying it's, it turns into a drudgery at that point, you know. But the newness kind of wears off. You know, it's not all the excitement and all that. There's other things that are, that, are, that are nice too, but you know, the two-year mark is where, okay, now this is work. Now this isn't just about you know, feeling, this, an emotion, and excitement. This is actual work that we have to put into this. It's the same way in church, right around that two-year mark. A lot of churches, that's where you know, people stick around for about two years, and it's like, well, people you think, oh, they're going to be here for a long time. We're going to grow old together. Two years into it, they're gone. That's usually how it goes. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to be total pessimist because, I, you know, the opposite is true too. There's people that hit that two-year mark and they've laid the foundation and they just keep right on trudging along. They've just, they've just made a habit out of these things. They put, made God's house a priority. 
they've laid the foundation and they just keep chugging along and they're there two years four years ten years 20 years there's people like that there's people like that in this church so i don't want to be a you know total pessimist but you know that is a wake-up call to some people that should be a warning to some people is that when you when the excitement wears off when it starts to fade and the christian life turns into actual work soul winning again yes <laughs> bible preaching again yes well what else that's it <laughs> you know just more of the same. That's what we're about here. You know, we're just going to keep doing that and doing that and preaching and going out and preaching and going out till Jesus comes. <clears throat> and if you don't have a foundation laid, you know, you, you might not make it through. You know, and just life itself. He said there that when he, that you build your house upon a rock when you do and hear when you hear and do his sayings. You got to hear them. You got to be here to hear them, by the way. You got to be in the word of God to hear it, by the way. You got to pull out the blueprint and look and say, there's where the foundation goes. This is what it's going to be built. Then you got to actually build it. You actually got to pour it. You got to actually implement it in your life. And that way, when the rains descend and the floods come and the winds blow and beat upon that house, it's not going to fall. It fell not. Why? Because it was founded upon a rock. Because it, was, it didn't fall because, because of the color it was painted. Because of the type of siding it had. Because it had a 30-year roof on it. No, all those things are nice, but the only reason why it stood is because of the foundation that it was standing on. That's what's going to see you through the storms of life. That's what's going to keep you going in the Christian life. You know, regular church attendance is a foundation that must be strongly laid in your life if you are going to make it in the Christian life. If you're going to make it in the Christian life, and again, it doesn't have to be this church. People get this idea, it's like, well, it's got to be you know, faithful word or bust. No, it's not true. That's not, that's not the right attitude. Are there some things that needs to be? Yeah, King James, salvation by grace through faith. Amen. And ideally, some form of outreach where they're actually trying to you know, publish the gospel in some shape or form. You know, ideally, door to door. But even if, if, if anything, bus route, something, right? It doesn't have to be this church. It has to be a church that has some basics down, okay? But let me move on from that. <coughs> look at the, look at the, uh, <coughs> well, let's go back to Ezra chapter six. And he said there, let the, ho let the house be builded. And where they offered sacrifices, let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. The height thereof, three score cubits, and the breadth thereof, uh, three score cubits. So, you know, he starts to give actual measurements. You know, and this is just gonna be a quick point. But we know we do want to leave room to grow numerically. Now, <coughs> we'll get, you know, because people often wonder when they come to church and they see this, they're like, well, how long are we going to be in this building? As long as we can fit in it, right? You know, we, we just got done, you know, having the walls painted and the trim put up and redecorating back here. And those things are fine and great. You know, but, but the, you know, the reason why I went ahead with that is because I realized we're going to be in here for a little while. <laughs> This is going to be a slow burn in Tucson, and I'm all for it, and I don't mind it. Because here's the thing. You know what grows fast? Weeds. Weeds are the things that, that grow up quickly overnight, and they're worthless. Right. Nobody likes weeds. And dandelions aren't weeds. No, that's not a debate. <laughs> okay. I don't want to go off on that. But anyway, I'm trying to say is this, is that, you know, I'm fine with this being a slow burn down here. I'm fine with Tucson being a slow-growing church because that means you're, you're, you're growing the right way. You don't want to be one of these churches that just springs up overnight. <clears throat> but we're going to be in this building until we need a bigger one. It was funny, I, you know, I talked to Brother Adam about the remodel in here. And we got, I was like, gave him the thumbs up that Sunday. And I walked out to leave Sunday night. And I noticed that this, this suite right across over here in the corner, both, both of them just opened up that day, like the, that, that week. So I was like, hmm, maybe I need to call Adam and tell him to never mind. and talk pastor and get in this bigger facility. And I started was looking in there. And they've got the big, tall ceilings, and they got the overall, I mean, it just, you know, it's like three or four times the size of this. And then I thought, we would be swimming in there. You know, that would be pointless. It would be better to just invest a little bit in here and get cozy in here, make the place look a little nicer. You can't do anything about this, right? <laughs> but we can do something about that, right? And I mean the walls, I'm not talking about you. No need to change out there. No need to change what's going on, right? 
but we're going to be in this facility because here's the thing. The facility is not our focus. You know, yeah, we did these things and they're nice because we're gonna, we are going to be in here for a little while, but we're not, you don't want to be in one of these churches where it's just like all about getting land and building a building. Right. I've done that. I've been there and I've done that. You start out with 60 people. And, and I remember there was a guy in my life at the time, he wasn't a member of our church, but he was a Christian. He went to another church and he said, just be careful. And he'd been around a while. I mean, he was already, you know, he'd, he'd been a Christian for longer than I'd been alive. And he's saying, look, I've been through this more than once. People are going to leave. Whenever you build a building, people get disgruntled. They start to argue about the color of the pews. They don't match the curtains and the carpet and blah, blah, blah. And people get petty and vindictive and malicious and bitter, and they split churches. I said, nah, not our church. And we had 10 acres outside of town, 10 acres. And we built a 12,000 square foot you know, uh, building or something like that with huge vaulted ceilings, beautiful building. Probably the biggest independent Baptist church in northern Michigan. And we had 60 people. <laughs> and we had a bus route. You know, we were bringing in, you know, 50 to 100 kids every Sunday. There was a lot going on on Sunday morning. But, you know, on Wednesday night before we left, there was 12 people. There's enough room for everyone to have 1,000 square feet to themselves. <laughs> and where did most of those people leave? They left. There were people leaving right as the church was getting finished. I mean, they were there putting up drywall, mudding, painting, sanding, putting in the lights, and then they're just, they're, they're not even there for the grand opening. And I said, you know, I, I would rather go back to the little UAW hall we started out in with the plastic chairs and have to go in and Sunday morning and clean up after all the drunks and clean up the beer and the cigarette butts from the, you know, the line dancing or whatever they were doing in there the night before. It's northern Michigan, folks. That's what they do. I would rather do that and have all the people back and have all the families back because it's not about facilities. It's about the people. That's not our focus, the building. A lot of churches, that's what, they get, that's what they're about. They just want to make sure they have this ornate, immaculate, you know, just beautiful pulpit that God just sent from heaven. You know, look at this pulpit. You know, you need further proof? There you go. And I love this pulpit, by the way. I think it's great. It, I love that it's fallen apart and it's sanded and it's beaten up. It's distressed, right? That's the, that's, it's got patina. But he said there, look, let, he said, uh, let, let, the, uh, let the height thereof and the breadth be of, you know, leave groom to grow numerically. And he said, let there be three great rows of stones and a row of new timber. He said, let there be three great stones and a new row of timber. Look, that's, you don't lay all that at once. You got to lay the first row. Then you gotta lay the second row. Then you gotta lay the third row. I mean, I've never. I'm not a mason. You know, I mean, like actual do masonry work. I'm not the other type of mason either. Okay, it won't see me doing this. If I'm doing this, it's because I'm scratching. All right. You know, I've got an itch somewhere. That's all. that's going on there. That's the only. But I've never done you know masonry work that I can remember anyway, where you laid brick. But I've seen guys do it, and I'm pretty sure you lay the bottom brick first, right? And then you then you lay the second row. You don't lay the f the top row and then build down. Right? You got to start at the bottom and work up. And, you know, that's how growth is going to be in a church. You got to lay the foundation first. You know, you get a core of people. And I feel like we've got that core in Tucson. You know, we've got people who kind of went through a little storm here this last early spring or late spring, summer, whenever some things went on, whatever. You know, we need to rehash all that. Some people went. That's fine, you know. But we ended up with a core of people. And I said, now we got our core. We got, a, we got that first row laid. You know, now it's time to lay a second row. And then we'll lay the third. You know, we'll get the fresh new timber later. So that's how it's going to grow. Growth is, is row upon row. It's a slow growth, growth. He goes on, he says, and I'll wrap up here. And he says in verse 4, With three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out of the king's house, and let the gold and golden and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought into Babylon, be restored and brought again unto the temple, every one to his place. So he said there, let the vessels be restored, every one to his place in the house of God. And that's how you build a church. You know, what are the vessels? You're the vessels. Amen. If you're in, are you in 2 Timothy? Look at verse 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Excuse me. Yeah, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. He said this, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Look, the foundation's laid, folks. The foundation of God is there. 
No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, in, which is Christ Jesus. That foundation is there. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord know, knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, there's some vessels, some, some of God's vessels out there. They're still out. Nebuchadnezzar still has them. I mean, they're vessels that, you know, God wants to save and fill, but they're out in the world. You know, Nebuchadnezzar still got them in possession. And you know, we got to go find those vessels and bring them in and, and clean them up and polish them off. And not just insist that, you know, we, only, we get the best vessels right away and just say only the most polished vessels here. No. You know, I imagine when they, I don't know what Nebuchadnezzar was doing with those vessels. I know what his son did at one point, you know, dr drinking wine and praising the gods of stone and, and other things. But, you know, maybe those vessels have been put in a storage closet for a while. And he said, what were these? You know, it's like the Christmas decorations box or something. That just you bring it out once a year. Oh, those are the vessels from the Lord's house, from that place in Jerusalem that we took over 70 years ago. And they've been collecting dust. You know, you've got to pull them out. You've got to get the cobwebs out, put the polish on them, put a shine on them. And that's what we need to do. That's how we're going to grow this church. You know, each vessel is going to be brought in, restored, and it's going to be put in his place in the church, in the house of God. He said, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not of only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and of some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, <coughs> sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared to every good work. Now I know I kind of preached about this a couple weeks ago, but you know, that's, what we, that's what we want to see happen in people's lives, as they begin to purge themselves from these things. And look, they're not going to do that right away. They're not just going to walk in here and be like, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I've got it all together. You know, they've, they've, they've just, their life is perfect. Everything's lined up. But that's not who we're looking for. You know, if that, if that happens, great. <laughs> Come on in. We'll take that too. But I'm saying, look, we want to use vessels that, that will purge themselves from these other things. That will be vessels that will be made unto, to meet for the master's use. Because <clears throat> God doesn't want to use a dirty vessel. Any more than you want to eat or drink out of one. Now, I was a bachelor once, and there might have been a few times where, you know, <laughs> that bowl could have been a little cleaner. <laughs> it's another story. But generally speaking, right, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to eat out of something. Like, if we're going to have a taco up sewn here this afternoon, and what if I just pulled all the plates from yesterday out of the trash? And so here you guys go. What's the matter? We don't like tacos? <laughs> oh, we love tacos. The plate's the problem. You know, it's that, it's that crusty fork you're handing me, Brother Corbin. And let me just go off on sweet tomatoes. You know, that's just, just, there's, finally, I, finally I can use that place as a sermon illustration. I mean, there's a place that's disgusting. I heard they went out of business. I'm so glad for it. This message was not brought to you by sweet tomatoes, by the way. You go in there and they have the crust. You've never been to the buffet that has the crusty handle? Everybody else's food and fingers have been on it. And it's just like, yo, who's going to want to eat that? You know, well, here's the thing. What, what, why is God going to want to use a vessel that the world's had its hands all over? You still got, you know, you still got some crusty sin in, on your, on your, in your vessel. God doesn't want to use that. You know, you should come to church. You should be in, the, you should be in God's house, you know, making sac sacrifices, laying the foundation, and getting yourself polished up. You know, start to work out that, those, those crusty sins and get them out so God can use you. And I'll close on this. He said there at the end, uh, if you would, in verse 7, he said, Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. He's saying, let the rulers rule. He said, let the governors and the elders build this house. And, you know, this is just, I'm going to close on this thought, is that, you know, you need to let leadership lead in a church. You need to let the leadership lead. And, you know, leadership's not going to be perfect. And if you would, go over to Hebrews chapter 13. They're going to make mistakes. But, he, he, you know, I'm not trying to, to, to lift myself up or put anybody any else down. But, I mean, who do you think is thinking about this place more than anybody else? You know, I hope, I hope somebody else could say it more than you, Brother Corbin, I am every day. And I'm sure people out there, they think about this place, think about our church, and they pray about it. But, I mean, I'm eating it, I'm sleeping it, I'm dreaming it. It's, it's every day thinking about this place. What I'm trying to say is this, I have Tucson's best interests in mind. 
That's what I want. I want the same, hopefully the same thing everybody else wants, this church to grow as God sees fit for us to win souls, for us to, you know, shade in the map, and not just because I, I like coloring, you know. I got, I mean, I got stacks of those books at home, my kids, you know. I got boxes of crayons, right? But I like shading that in because it tells me, look, we went to that neighborhood. We knocked every door there. Maybe somebody got saved. Maybe they didn't. You know, we, but we went and we did our part. We went into all the world as God commissioned us to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Amen. every neighborhood, every street, every door. That's a big goal, I know. That's why we need more help. That's why we need more people. That's why we need to be more consistent at it and do more of it. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is that that's, that's where my heart is. And I trust that's where everybody else's heart is. I mean, that's the type of church we're running. So let me lead. You know, and I've got Pastor Anderson, you know, he, he gives me a lot of leeway and lets me do things, you know, and ultimately he's leading. But, you know, trust the leadership to lead in the right direction. And if they do something wrong, you know, that's not like, well, I knew it. I could have done it better. I mean, come on. Does that really look great to you? <laughs> and yes, it does. It finally does. You know, I think you've been in here long enough, it finally starts to look gray. You know, when we first watched you, are like, that looks a little purple. <laughs> Didn't want to say the other one, you know, pink, you know, too much. But, you know, wh who picked that out? Blah, 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 you know, whatever. Well, I did. I, mean, I think it turned out okay. Amen. I think it looks nice. But that's just one little thing, you know, but people get bent out of shape with that kind of stuff. You know, we might make mistakes along the way. You know, we're going to talk about how to do follow-up and stuff like that and things like that in the future. You might not agree. And you know what? I'm open to ideas, but let me just put this out there. Don't ever suggest an idea if, you're, if you can't ha handle being told no. Just don't do that to yourself. And, you know, if you, if you say, hey, I think we, you ever want to try this? And, I, you know, there might be something to say, yeah, that's a great idea. And I love new ideas. And we could try something. But maybe you say, you know what, that sounds good, but you've got to think about this. You've got to think about that. And that's just not the way we do things. Let the governors and the elders build the house of God. Let them lead in that, you know. He's not saying there, let just those guys take out the shovel and the trowel and do all the work while all, everybody else just stands by and watches them. He's saying, but let them lead. Let them dictate and say, this person's good at this. That person's good at that. They, we should do this. We should do this then and do this there. Let them lead. You know, trust the leadership of the speed. And I'll just end here. It says there in verse 12, he said uh, in verse 12, and the God that hath caused his name to dwell, uh, uh, I'm getting, I don't know, I'm losing my spot here. Oh, yeah, yeah, verse 12. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I mean, God takes church pretty seriously. He's taking this house of God pretty seriously. He's saying, look, if they do anything, tear down their house and hang them with the timber and then make it into a dunghill. That's a pretty severe punishment, but that is something I'm going to get at. He said, I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. Let it be done with speed. Look, you need to apply the wisdom of Cyrus to your life with haste. You know, some of us are, you know, kind of like what I did, you know, came, came into the Christian life a little bit later in life. We have some catching up to do. You need to let it be done with speed. Don't hesitate to um, employ the wisdom of Cyrus in your life. So I've been out of church for years. I've never been in a church. I'm backslidden. You know what? Get it right today. Start today. I don't go soul winning. I haven't been soul winning a long time. I'm inconsistent. Fix it today. Let it be done with speed. I don't read my Bible anymore. I quit reading. Don't wait till don't wait till New Year's. Don't wait for the New Year's sermon where I try to motivate you to read again. Do it today. Amen. Now. Let it be done with speed. You know, today is the day to get back in the fight. And if you know what you say, well, I'm already in the fight. I haven't fallen out. Then today is the day to determine not to fall out in the fight. So I've laid the foundation. Today's the day to say, you know what? I'm going to lay the next layer. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on the foundation. You know, we need to apply the wisdom of Cyrus to our church and to our personal lives with speed. Let's go ahead and pray.